Now, we're doing Springvale tonight. It's in the heart of the wine region. Uh, it's between Bishno and Swansea. We're in Bishno. Swansea's a half an hour down the road for those of you that uh, aren't familiar. So region starts from just this side of the Tasman Peninsula where Port Arthur is. It heads up the coast uh, past Swansea and Bishno and the uh, Freysnaif Peninsula and goes right up another hour up the road, the Great, East, Great Eastern Drive up to uh, St Helens and the Bay of Fires. Hi, Annika. Hi, Karen. Um, yeah, so between Swansea and Bishno, there's a concentration of vineyards and wineries. And we are going to visit one of the old ones on one of the farms that was settled when white people first came to Tasmania, a bit like Kelvin and last week. But this week we're visiting the Lyon family. And the term family is going to come up a fair bit tonight. Um, the Lyon family first arrived in Tasmania in 1826. Uh, William Lyon arrived with his wife and five children. And the Springvale property has been in this family's hands since 1875, resulting in a richly interwoven history of innovation, struggle and achievement for the area which is also happens to be the oldest rural municipality in Australia. So what we've got on site at the moment are the fifth, sixth and seventh generations of the Lyon family. And it is a vineyard. We've spoken before about the difference between a vineyard and a winery, and there will be a test. We may be deciding to have a little test at the end of this series of virtual tastings and uh, maybe win, win yourself a bottle of wine. Um, yeah, so this one is a vineyard. In 1986, Rodney Lyon, the fourth, fifth generation, planted the first vines and he planted, I think it was 6.6 .6 hectares at that stage. Over the years, they've continued to add and have just finished planting their latest batch, including Shiraz, Manure, Manure and Pinot Gris. And so they're up to a total of 31.6 hectares now. It's uh, one of the bigger vineyards around. They also have a cellar door. Less than half of the vineyards uh, wine producers in our East Coast wine region have a cellar door, but this one does. And it's a really charming cellar door and a little old stone, stone building on the property right next to the, between the homestead and the vines. So in 2001, the winery was built. It's one of two vineyards where dad built a winery for his daughter when she graduated as a winemaker. In this case, Chris came back from graduating with her husband, Dave, in tow. And from 2001, when they did their first vintage, and I say they, although Dave was a viticulturalist and Chris the winemaker, Chris had her first baby uh, right on first vintage. I'm just going to let Helen join us again. live with Helen. Um, yes, she had her first baby. Dave kicked in. They made the wine together. And they continued to do that from 2001 through to 2013. Helen, just giving a little bit of a history of the Lyon family. We're up to where the winery was built and Chris came and did the vintages from 2001 to 2013. Now, you might want to tell us a bit about the... Uh, in a city winery in Brisbane because Dave and Chris, after 2013, took off up to Queensland. Chris went into teaching for a while. She's just one of those girls that can do anything she puts her mind to. Uh, but she got bored with that. So she's now with Dave at the inner city winery that they set up in Brisbane and making wine again and going great guns. Their intention when they went up there was to make wines that were suitable for that climate. Now, what that so meant they're, was... So, sorry, they're, so they're in, yeah. in partnership with, with, um, with someone up there and the City Winery Brisbane is quite a large complex that involves a restaurant and bar and function centre but the most exciting thing about it, of course, is it's an actual winery. So what they do is they source their grapes from around, actually all up and down the east coast, I think, not just from Queensland, but also down down through New South Wales as well. 
Um, so yeah. they choose their grapes for the type of grapes and the quality of grapes and um, they take it back to their city winery and they make wine and it's apparently going, well, I don't know what's happened during COVID, but it certainly has been going um, uh, really well over the last probably 18 months, I reckon it's been open. Yeah. Well, hmm. according to Brother Tim today, it's going great guns. Yeah. Oh, good. So what, right. what, what this <laughs> meant was that when Chris left in 2013, Springvale advertised and they got themselves a, an employed winemaker who's been making the wine there up until 2019. He uh, went off to, I think, return home to Western Australia and they employed Barry Pooge, who's become their new winemaker on site and... The rosé that we're tasting tonight is his first vintage for the winery. Um, I think the interesting thing here, Tim said today, they're really humbled every time they, when they advertise for someone, they're really humbled by the number of people who are interested in coming to Tasmania to make wine and particularly interested in coming to Springvale. So Barry was pretty excited about Pinot Noir and wanted to come down here. He'd come from Killicanoo, uh, where he'd taken the winery through his winemaking up into Halliday's Winery of the Year, James Halliday's. So he's a very stylish and accomplished winemaker. They're pretty excited about the wines that he's going to be making there with great finesse. Now, I just think it's interesting that he's come in from interstate to Tasmania because he wants to be part of our wine scene. Meanwhile, the Lyme family have gone up to Queensland and extended the tentacles up there and, and uh, extending influence across the national scene. By, yeah, absolutely. By... Yeah. It's happening all over the place. We've got a lot to offer and we've got a lot that people uh, want to come and be part of. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So for those that know more about this than me, I'm going to tell you the soil is mostly fertile clay loam. The subsoil varies from porous friable loam to rock and medium to heavy clay, but with excellent drainage. And you might find it interesting, although I have no idea what it means, uh, that they use modified lyre or a U-shaped system in their trellising and vertical shoot positioning. Fabulous. So I'm going to write those I... things down. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I do know uh, that there are differences. Some of the vineyards on the east, in the East Coast wine region are planted in um, a European style. Others are planted in an American style. And that all contributes to that word we had last week, terroir. So whether they are planted vertically to the hill and the breeze, breezes come up and it keeps the frost away or whatever, yeah. It all influences how closely the vines are planted together, influences the weather conditions and the microclimate and therefore the wine that we get at the other end. So I've raved on Excellent. enough. Helen, why don't okay, you, so can we, you tell us a bit about rosé? Yeah, yeah. So rosé, it's quite interesting, the history of rosé, because rosé may well have been the very first wine that was some um, drunk way back when wine became a drink. Um, or when they were when they were squeezing grapes to um, to make it and to make it into alcohol, because the first wine that was made they hardly ever left the skins on for very long. They used to take the skins off quite quickly before they um, uh, strained the the juice, if you like, and and turned it, and put it into fermentation. Um, so because. The, the wine that they wanted to drink was the very light pinkish sort of coloured wine. Anything that was darker than that, that looked more like what we know as a claret, um, it, they, just, they just didn't want to drink. They weren't interested in it. So that was in the early days. And then towards the Middle Ages, um, rosé was still a thing, but it was just starting to sort of change and they were just started playing around with different... Um, Different grapes, and uh, but it wasn't actually until and so sorry and so what came from the Middle Ages onwards the Bordeaux style of a of a much more richer claret sort of wine was much became much more popular throughout France and Italy and those European um, countries. So 
um, it wasn't really until World War after World War Two that rosé came back into vogue. And guess what? You and I will remember this. We it do. It was all uh, about I... Matus. It's all about Matus rosé from Portugal, Absolutely. and that was very much made for the um, the the European and American market. And um, uh, Matus rosé was uh, it was sort of a it's a it's it's a very pink, sparkly, light, um, light wine that, uh, you know, I remember liking it when, uh, when I was a teenager. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So like a lot of wines, they come in and out of vogue, but like the Lyme family, rosé has an amazing history. So... I think we should taste some. Yeah, absolutely. So, so a, a lot of the modern rosés are made out of, um, uh, a, a mainly made out of the Pinot Noir grapes. Um, mm -hmm. But in fact, all over the world, all sorts of red grapes have been used to make um, rosés. So you can, and, and it's really interesting having the, the Springvale, which is made from a combination of the Shiraz and Menier. Is that right? Yes. Pinot Menier. A 60-40 ratio. Yeah. Um, That's right. And yep. uh, but other great other rosés are made from cabernet, um, but the majority of rosés are actually made from uh, from the pinot noir. Um, yeah. yeah, and rosés vary from you know they're they're right across the spectrum from really quite sweet, almost frizzanti sort of um, drinks to your more dry. Um, full-bodied sort of rosés. So, and that that really depends on how long the skins from the red grapes sit on the on the grapes to get that colour and the robustness. Yeah. And Tim was saying because the, of the Shiraz, it doesn't sit on skins at all. The the mm. colour comes from the grapes. So, uh, well, it must have a little bit of skin skin there. Yeah. They just take the skins off um, sooner rather than later. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this one's described as having sunset hues, and we've had some. Sunsets just like this, this window uh, lately. Oh, it's been sensational. So it's really nice. I really like it. I like it. It's it's quite dry. Yes. Sorry, Julie. That bottle is not three quarters full. It's only missing that much <laughs> priory ridge. You cheeky. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not showing We're you my bottle then. <laughs> oh, okay, I should show you. I should show you my my glass. Um. <laughs> Yeah, so it's so well, it is interesting. I had an interesting question about um, uh, what makes and what's the difference between an orange wine and a rosé because we've come across some really interesting what they call an orange wine. It's not just wine from the the region of Orange in New South Wales. It's actually a wine style called orange wine. So it turns out that um, orange wine is not rosé at all. It's, it's rosé is made from red grapes and what gives it the colour is actually the skins from the red grapes and the colour varies depending on how long you leave the skin on. So um, the red grapes, if they're not made into rosé, they're made into whatever red wine is, the Cabernet, the Shiraz, the Pinots, etc. But with, um, and of course with white wine, um, white wine of course is made from white grapes, whatever they are, Riesling, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, um, where they take the skins off immediately so that it doesn't colour the wine. So the wine ends up, you know, that that sort of grassy yellow, um, uh, you know, all the different different colours that you get in white wine. Orange wine is made from white grapes, but they leave the skins on for a longer time, and it's the skins that actually give the orange tint to the to the wine. So how fascinating is that? I know. It, it's, we <laughs> that have so a bit of fascinating to news today. <laughs> we have so much to learn. So um, red fruits enriched with a subtle spice of white pepper and pink peppercorns for a prolonged savoury finish. I it's, love it. Um, yeah. I love it. I think it is. Savoury is a really good word for it, actually. I mean, a lot of rosés, I think, are really good for, you know, summer afternoon barbecue sort of sort of wines on the deck. Um, yeah. But this is quite robust and I like the idea of it being savoury because you can you can just drink it with, you can drink it with a steak or you can drink it with chicken or, you know, or you can have it with cheese. It's just really, it's quite complex and interesting. It's very smooth, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I'm going to just do a very quick plug here 
for Hello, us. Alex. Nice to see you from Western Australia. Now, I know that this is back to front, but it says cheese therapy. So for it's those of you that aren't aware, Helen, Helen's been in Victoria for eight weeks now, and for the next two weeks she's going to be doing these tastings from a hotel Who room knows where? in Hobart. Uh, Who knows? Because she is coming home, but she's got to have a little stay over. But so it's just been the dogs, myself, and sorry, uh, sorry, Annie. Subi, get freighted cellar door. It's Springvale we're looking at. Springvale, yeah, Springvale Rosé. Rosé. Yeah. So me and the internet, uh, cheese therapy comes up, showcasing small cheese makers in Australia. So I just go, yeah, please, I'd like some different cheese. Um, the reason I'm mentioning that is partly because I've got an ash brie from up on the Sunshine Coast to have tonight with my rosé. Yeah. But if you hop online now, the cheese maker, the small cheese maker that they're featuring this week is Grandview from Tasmania. Now, Grandview are down the uh, south of Hobart, down the channel. They make some fantastic cheeses. Um, but they also wanted to reuse the sheep whey. They used to, they used to use it, uh, they used to give it to the farmers next door to feed the pigs. But young Ryan down there thought he could do better. So he now makes sheep whey gin and sheep whey vodka. It's won lots of awards internationally. I think it's the only vodka and gin in the world that's made with sheep whey. Um, so hop online, go to Cheese Therapy and order yourself some Grandview sheep cheese. And if you need some of their gin, just contact us and we send you some. So uh, the other one that I've got to have tonight is a bit of... Uh, an amazing Persian feta from West Haven. Oh, in the, nice. The I love that. Yeah. Okay. So that's Well, you're very I'm lucky. At. I can't wait to get back to Tasmania to get all that stuff. Mind you, there's, you know, there's also some really good wine and, and cheese around the Mornington Peninsula, of course. It's just that we've just gone into absolute lockdown again. Um, so, so the Mornington Peninsula is included okay. in the stage three restrictions in Melbourne. So, um, I'm mm. stuck here in that until Sunday when I fly out and then go into some anonymous hotel somewhere for two weeks in Hobart. Yeah. Well, just keep thinking about East Coast wines <laughs> and maybe that's a good line to move on to this one, this silky and voluptuous wine. Oh, I have to get another glass. Just hold on oh, a minute. Dear. Yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> just going to disappear for a minute. Okay, come on back. Um, so this is the Estate Pinot. In uh, now, 2006, Tim came back, who is another member of the family. He graduated with a viticulture degree and a master's in business administration. He was very, so gracious today, acknowledging that it was the building of the winery and the return of Chris, which had been a real catalyst, catalyst for the growth of Springvale. And obviously, it's still in good hands. Rodney who planted the original vines, the father, who's turning 70 next month. Happy birthday. No, Rodney. is he? Wow. He is. I asked him today if he's still an, an innovator because he's always been quite innovative in his farming practices and in being one of the early adopters of, of planting vines, etc. And Tim said, yes, he certainly is. And he's Tim's sounding board. Anyway, the point is, in 2007, just after Tim came back, Springvale bought the property next door called Melrose. Melrose. And that's why they have two Pinot Noirs uh, and a couple of different Sav Blancs. Um, Melrose Pinot Noir is a lovely, light, flavoursome Pinot that is made from grapes that come off the Melrose property. The original, when they bought the property, it was the vines were quite established and they'd already been making wine there under the brand of Bishop's Rock. Rock. Yeah, Bishop's Rock. So these are this wine is from vines that have been growing on the Springvale property since 1986, and this is their premium. So they so they Mel, so they Melrose Pinot. They tend to release quite early as a as a light immediate drinking Pinot. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. I noticed that they've just released their 2020 Melrose Pinot. 
Um, what we're drinking now is the estate um, 2017 Pinot. So mm. this would be, so it's 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 sort of two ends of the spectrum of Pinots that Springvale have. Yeah, and we're tasting wines from two different winemakers uh, over the history of Springvale. The rosé from oh. Barry Pooch, the new one, and uh, this little Pinot was made by the previous winemaker there. So that's also very savoury. Just... That that Pinot. Uh, yeah, isn't it savoury yeah. and I, I think a bit spicy, but the words that people that know a lot more than me use are plum and strawberry, classic plum and strawberry characters, overlaid on strawberry. earth and oak. I'm getting the earth. Um, <laughs> and it creates a stylish, delicious Pinot Noir with a generous silky palette, and I'm certainly getting the silky palette. I just want I just want everyone to um, to realise that it's it's okay if you don't get, you know, strawberry and chocolate and whatever else there because everybody's palate is different and uh like, and we don't get ooh. i don't get any strawberry out of that but i get some spiciness i think that's that's true which may be related to the earthiness as well um but yeah you know, everyone's palate is different yeah. and you just sort of have to decide whether you like the the flavor of it in your mouth or or not and some people will love it and, and whether you can afford wonder. that particular bottle of wine or you can't too. that's so right that's we're right. just all about that and price doesn't always price doesn't, price doesn't always determine whether you're going to like it or not, and it also doesn't always determine whether it's great or not. It certainly doesn't. But I tell you what, in our East Coast wine region, I think we have a wine for everybody that spans the palates and the price range. Absolutely. So that's, uh, well, that's the interesting thing about doing this, doing the the farm shed, um, and having the what have we got? 120 different wines or whatever it is um that the the variety and the range of both prices and and um flavor flavor levels is just um yeah. incredible so yeah it's really interesting yeah. to it's interesting to have new people that are really new to to wine to come in and just taste a few because they want to know what what this thing is about and you know, and, it's, and we're able Absolutely. to provide that, and that's fantastic. And we're also able to provide, you know, high quality, many awards, um, James Halliday sort of uh, wines that um, you know people that know more than us. Um, yeah, uh, you yeah. know, they're sought we after. Get, so we get quite a lot of winemakers in too. And remember when we had that Chinese guy who opened the first yes. uh, first nightclub in Beijing, the first wine bar. And, he, and then he had then he had children, yeah. so he didn't want to work nights. So now yeah. he imports wine to China. That's right, which is an ever growing market for wine. So he took away a couple from the farm shed to yeah. to try out and yeah, have yeah. a look at. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all the we've got time for today. Yep, but I think we've pretty much covered. Uh, so. I mean, if you want us to match a wine to your palate in your pocket, just give us a call or email us. Go online, have a look at our shop. Um, oh, Helen, I forgot to look at who we're doing next week. Yeah, I was just thinking about that too. Um, well, I you'll have it's... to check Instagram or Facebook. We'll yeah, pop it have on a look on the or have a look on the website. It's actually all listed on the website. If you go to the website, there's a there's a um, menu item on the right hand side called virtual wine tastings, and if you mm. click on that, you can see. What what the whole um, list of what we're doing? I actually think it might be it's either Milton or yeah. Craigie No. Yeah, it's one of those. I just so can't um, remember which way it went? I'm going to nip out and uh, have dinner with a friend tonight, and okay. I think this is going to go really beautifully with the osabuka that she's been cooking since yesterday. Oh, nice. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Thanks, well, Julie. Well, I'll see Thanks you. So I'll much see for everyone. Joining us. I'll see Whether everyone you're from live. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'll see everyone from some anonymous hotel in Hobart somewhere. I might yeah, be looking. Well, I've still got, I've got COVID hair, so it's going to get worse as the next two two weeks go. But thank you, Julie, I, for the wishes. I can do a ponytail now. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Thanks right. so much for joining us live. Thanks so much for watching this. The 400 of you that watch it after they go onto Instagram and Facebook and onto our website. Um, we love East Coast wines. We love learning about them. We hope you do too. We hope we'll, you'll join us next week again. Thanks, We're halfway through the region. We've got Thanks, Karen. To go. 
Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you.